Welcome Rotarians and guests to the Rotary Club of York. Each of us are community leaders living out our service above self motto, and it is a great day to be a Rotarian. If you would recite the four-way test with me, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Yes, oh yes, oh yes. One of the strengths of any great organization is when everybody can agree to believe in at least one thing. And our belief in the four-way test is a way to conduct ourselves, truly sets us apart as community leaders. Ours is an awesome club. And this year I had the privilege of being your president. For those of you who don't know, I'm Aaron Jacobs and I'd like to welcome you to the club today. Let's start off with a round of applause. And I'll tell you, we got a great program today, but first we're going to enjoy the opening song and the pledge, God Bless America by Leanne Wilson, followed by the invocation, Steve Feldman, and visitor introductions by Brittany Beam. Leanne. Rotarians and guests, please join me in God Bless America. God bless America. Lands that I love. Could you unmute yourself, Stand please? Guide her and guide her through the night with the light from above. From the mountains to the prairies to the oceans, white with all. God bless America, my home. Sweet heart, God bless America, my heart, sweet home. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please join me in a word of prayer. O oh, Lord of the universe, you know from our many conversations that I am a profound lover of history. And while I don't claim to be the world's greatest historian, I do believe that an understanding of history helps us to understand how we got where we are and gives us a glimpse of where we might be going. We are grateful for our speaker today and ask your blessing on him as he works to make history more of a teacher for his audiences. Help us all to broaden our understanding and to never be afraid to examine aspects of our life together that are uncomfortable or different from our experience. Or as religious historian Justo Gonzalez puts it, a person wearing tinted glasses can avoid the conclusion that the entire world is tinted only by being conscious of the glasses themselves. Be with this Rotary Club in its time together and in our going back out into our community. Fill us with gratitude for our opportunities and for the work of those around us, including those who served us our, our meal. Lead us to serve, to lead, and to care for our world, both immediate and distant, with truth, mutual well-being, fairness, and kindness toward all. Amen. I am pleased to have the honor of introducing our guests for today's meeting. When I call your name, please stand and remain standing until President Aaron has welcomed you. Mary Dixon, guest of our speaker. Cindy Donnelly, guest of Tom Donnelly. Kathy Brown, guest of Teresa Gregory. Madeline Torres Ocasio, guest of Gina Spangler. The next two are guests of past district governor, um, Ben Hoover, uh, Jennifer Rojar, Ulrika Weissenborn, and then Joe Silo, guest of Larry Richardson. Thank you, Brittany. To our friends all the way from Germany, guten tag. 
Uh, it's great to see these guests today. And to these guests, I'm going to tell you a little secret that the rest of the members that don't want you to know. When they first came to this club, they were a guest just like you. And soon they became a member. And all 285 of these people just became a guest or were guests. That means, technically speaking, you have already taken the first step to being a member of our club. So do come back again and start thinking about being our 286th member. Rotarians, please join me in welcoming our guests. Thank you. Time for announcements. First and foremost, a foretaste of the feast to come on October 25th. That's in a few weeks. Our weekly meeting program will feature a panel of candidates who are running for your county commissioner. The panel will be moderated by Rotarian Heather Warner and past president Mike Summers is requesting that club members submit their questions to him in advance of this meeting so that we may present a wide range of questions to the candidates and make best use of our time. So please email Mike by no later than October 18th with the questions you'd like to ask. And if you don't have his email, download Club Runner like Communications has been telling you to do, right? Um, the following committees will meet on October 11th. The PPE committee will meet via Zoom. The fundraising committee will meet at 1115 at the Country Club of York. And the Service Above Self Committee will meet 115 at the Country Club of York. Also, uh, speaking of PPE, on October 11th, we will have our next CRDC plastic pickup for those of you who have been gathering your plastics. Please bring them to recycle uh, with the volunteers before our meeting in the CCY parking lot down below. On to the President's Challenge. Is Jen here? Jen is here. So to remind you, we've been doing this for a while now, the President's Challenge is a way for committees to inform you, promote, and solicit, and recruit new members and ideas. Um, my challenge, though, to you isn't to the committee, but my challenge is to you to consider joining a new committee or an additional committee and bringing your ideas so we can grow the service of this club. And it is with great pleasure that I welcome Jen May to talk about the idea committee. Jen. Thank you, Aaron. Let's see if it'd be better with, without. It's better. Okay. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Jen May. I am co chair of the IDEA committee. And as per our charge, the purpose of the IDEA committee is to advise officers of the Rotary Club of York on matters pertaining to inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility. Based on survey feedback, our primary tasks in the past two years have been aligned with the goal of making this club more welcoming. And if you're sitting there right now thinking to yourself, I feel totally welcome here. I've never felt unwelcome. Perhaps you should join our club and you can help us make other people feel more welcome. Um, this is just a glimpse into what we have accomplished in the past two years. We have recommended the mentorship program to the membership committee to ensure that new Rotarians are supported by personally acclimating them to the club over a span of three months. We have suggested speakers to the program committee that showcase diversity-based or diversity-owned businesses. We have organized acknowledgement of significant days and months that celebrate diversity and inclusion, such as International Women's Day and Pride Month. And while vol volunteering is not our primary goal, we believe that it is an unwritten charge for most committees. And so we work with the Cornerstone Cleanup, the Lebanon Cemetery, and the Three Kings Celebration in this past year. Moving forward, our goal is to continue to make all feel welcome at the Rotary Club of York. Whether you have been a Rotarian for 40 years, whether you're brand new, if you identify as white, black, Hispanic, gay, straight, socioeconomically advantaged or disadvantaged. We are a group of 285 civically minded professionals who have personally and in smaller committees made great contributions to our local community and to the world. 
Imagine what this club could accomplish if we worked more cohesively with the four-way test as the foundation of all that we do. If this concept speaks to you, I encourage you to join our committee. And if you don't wanna join the committee, then we welcome you to volunteer with us this upcoming year, showing the citizens of York that our club is a welcoming place to anyone who puts service above self. One of our upcoming service projects uh, is the Three Kings event. Three Kings Day is a Hispanic tradition that marks the 12th day of Christmas. The York County Hispanic Coalition holds an event every January. This year, we will collect new toys for ages birth through 12 years and monetary donations starting next week, October 11th and running through November 1st. In addition, put this on your calendars, we will help and volunteer at the event on January 12th and 13th. And we would love to have individuals from various committees volunteer with us. Um, if you would like to know more about the committee, please reach out to one of our many committee members. If you are on the IDEA committee, could you please stand so everybody knows who they can come to? Thank you. And although this was the president's challenge today that I'm doing this presentation for, the IDEA committee has a challenge for all of you. As you leave today, introduce yourself to someone that you have never spoken to before. Or, and next week, sit with someone at lunch that you have never had lunch with. Our committee be believes that these small gestures can make a huge impact for the Rotary Club of York. Thank you. Thank you, Jen and Idea. Jen, I have a question. How about how many members are on your committee? Approximately. A 18 or so. That's a large committee. Thank you, Jen. The reason why I bring that up in, in the world of Rotary, that's bigger than some Rotary clubs. This is also one of our newest committees, which I think speaks to our club in the community, our investment in diversity and being welcomed to all who want to join or be a part of Rotary. And that happened under Calvin and Jen's leadership, and they deserve a round of applause. Thank you. It's time for new members to be introduced to the club, and I'd like to invite past President Josh George and our new members to the podium. Past President Josh. Thank you, President Aaron. I appreciate you drumming up some applause for me. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, Rotarians and guests. It's great to be here with you again, like I am so frequently, and I'm fortunate to be up here so frequently because that means we are adding members to our club. And uh, President Aaron, I don't know if the 285 includes these four members or these 86, 87, 88, or 89. I'm in sales, so I always round up. So it's pretty much 300 at this point. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I would first like to introduce you to Kate Newland. Kate is the female up in the group here today. That should be fairly obvious. Kate is a graduate of Carlisle High School, and she went to Messiah College where she earned her BS in accounting. She went on to Scranton University, where she earned a master's in curriculum and instruction. She now is the owner of Kate's World Travel, which is a boutique travel agency that Kate started very recently. And uh, she would like to talk to you about any of your travel plans if you have an opportunity to chat with her after today's meeting. Uh, prior to uh, starting her travel agency, she taught uh, at uh, both York Suburban and Susquehannock for about 16 years. So she spent most of her career so far in public education. Her community service includes uh, doing some builds for Habitat for Humanity and also volunteering for Special Olympics. Her hobbies include travel, walking through the neighborhood, swimming, and this one is a fun one, baking macaroons, which you'll have to ask her about as well, because I'm sure you might want to have one of those at some point. She is married to Christopher, and she is proposed for membership by Sarah White. Ladies and gentlemen, Kate Newland. And moving down the chain that way, next is Zach Claghorn. Zach is a graduate of William Penn Senior High School. 
He went to York College, where he earned his Bachelor of Arts in Political Science, and uh, stayed at York College, where he earned a Master's in Public Policy and Administration. He is the Executive Director of Resource York. His community service includes, uh, he went through the Leadership Training Program at Leadership York. Thank you, Wilda. He was a leader for the YCOSP Mentorship Program while at York College. He is a board member of the York Opioid Collaborative, and he is a board member of the Advantage Program here in York. And he also served as a drumline instructor for the Bearcat Marching Band. His hobbies include singing, acting, dancing, piano, songwriting, and this one I want to see, rapping. Okay, after the meeting, after the meeting. <laughs> and Zach is proposed by President Aaron Jacobs, Zach Claghorn. Next, we have Matt Poff. Matt is a graduate of the Christian School of York and earned his Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from Penn State and then an MBA from York College. Matt is the CFO of the York Water Company. And if you're like me, you've probably seen Matt at the Economics Club breakfast uh, for the last, oh, I don't know, 25 years or so. I don't know, that, but we've gotten to know each other through those Economics Club breakfasts over the years. It's great to have you here at Rotary at lunchtime as well. Matt's community service includes, uh, he's a board member for the York County Community Foundation. He serves on the finance committee at Leg Up Farm. He also serves on the finance committee for the York County Economic Alliance. And he is advisory board member for the Penn State York Graham Center. His hobbies include spending time with family and all Penn State sports. He's married to Amy and they have two kids, Benjamin, who is 19 and Ella, who is 17. And it may come as no surprise that he is proposed by JT Han. Ladies and gentlemen, Matt Poff. And last but certainly not least, we have Richard Gilbert. Richard is a graduate of Shawnee High School, which is in Medford, New Jersey. He went on to the University of Delaware, where he earned his degree in accounting, and then he went to Drexel, where he earned his MBA. He works for the Federal Reserve System in Baltimore. Ask him about all your financial needs and wants and interest rates and all of those kind of good things. And he serves there as the vice president of the large bank division. Ask him about bank failures. That's always a fun topic as well. His hobbies include, or his community service rather, includes he's a board member and assistant coach for York Little League. He's been an assistant treasurer and a scout leader for Boy Scouts. And he also served as an assistant coach when he lived in the Richmond area for Richmond Little League. His hobbies include biking, swimming, fishing, and kids' sports. And he has two kids, Eliza, who is 12, and Ben, who is 9. And he is proposed by Darren Smith. Ladies and gentlemen, Richard Gilbert. Thank you, past President Josh George. So I said in the introductions that each one of these new members started this club by coming as a guest. See, it's not a coincidence. I'm not crazy. Well, I am crazy, but um, I'm so pleased that you have taken the next step to be a member of our club. And I bet you'll be glad that you are too. And we hope as new members, you bring us new ideas, new energy, and more leadership muscle for our community. Now, Jen brought up a new challenge, and I agree with this, that we should take the time to get to know them. They took the first step to become the member, and now it's up to the rest of you to help make sure that they stay. And we'll start by welcoming them with a round of applause. Thank you. Now it's time for the program, and I'm telling you it's a good one. I'd like to bring up Tom Donnelly to introduce our speaker today. Tom. Thank you, President Aaron. John Dixon and I were college teammates. We played on the Princeton soccer team. And John's nickname was Big Dog. Hi, Big Dog. He would go after a loose soccer ball like a dog after a bone. He was that tough. And we're both tall guys. John, just stand up for a second. You'll, they'll get to see you then. But we were the tallest fullbacks in the Ivy League. Our job was to stop the other team from scoring. And um, so we won most of the head balls. It was my feet I had some problems with. But you'll see in a few minutes, John has a good head on his shoulders. So um, 
But the players trying to score against us were these shifty, speedy, sneaky forwards on the other team. And uh, that was tough for me. So I had to do some uh, rough tackling. I had to do some trash talking, try to keep these guys from scoring. A little bit like Al Sykes when he's at the podium up here. Uh, and John was always there to back me up. So big dog, I appreciate you. And I really want to uh, welcome Mary Boyle, Boyle Dixon to the program today, John's wife. We're delighted. Cindy and I are just having a great time being able to visit with them for a few days. So we're looking forward to getting them back to York, PA in the future. So welcome, Mary. <clears throat> well, I definitely wasn't practicing the four-way test out on the soccer field there in those days because I was doing anything to keep those guys from scoring. But Aaron, thank you for uh, reinforcing the four-way test and get it, getting us, making sure that we're keeping it in mind. So I, I am practicing it now. And um, John had a 26-year career as a foreign service officer working for the U.S. Information Agency and working for the State Department. Just think about that. Representing our U.S. interests around the world and, and out of Washington, D.C. And so he'll be sharing his experiences and his lessons learned from his book, that he wrote in 2021, History Shock. Uh, if anyone is interested, it's a fascinating book. I loved reading it, and that's why I got John down here. Uh, if anybody's interested in getting it, uh, I can make arrangements then with John to get you a signed copy, whatever. Uh, it's available beyond that, but I, I think you would enjoy it. It's, it's a really good read. <clears throat> Rotary International, as you know, is the largest youth exchange program in the world. And John exemplifies our Rotary ideals. Following graduating from Princeton uh, the year after me, 1976, John served in the Peace Corps in Gabon for four years. And that's where he met Mary, who was also serving in the Peace Corps. John then earned a master's degree in education administration before embarking on a 26-year career here. And he was serving or directing the interests of the U.S. in Mexico, Canada, Nigeria, South Africa, Haiti, Peru, working on Cuba out of Washington, D.C., and South America generally as well. Wow. Wow. John's been busy in his retirement, earning another master's degree in public and applied history at the University of Massachusetts, being a volunteer leader in Pittsfield, Mass., where he and Mary live in the beautiful Berkshire Mountains in western Massachusetts, and in his spare time authoring History Shock, which we'll be learning about today. So it is my great pleasure to introduce my friend, Big Dog, John Dixon. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. You had a, a good meal and met maybe a little food for thought now afterwards. I hope it doesn't create indigestion on your part, but uh, I do appreciate just as, as a starting point, the prayer we had, because it really goes to the, the nub of things I want to say. I, I'm so pleased to be here at Rotary. Can everybody hear me? Okay, good. <clears throat> I'm so pleased to be here at Rotary. I ran into Rotary constantly when I was overseas uh, I saw the Rotary Youth Exchange, Peace Corps and Rotary have pro, uh, collaborative programs as well. Uh, and then in Ottawa, my last overseas, I call Ottawa overseas, but it's not really overseas, is it? <laughs> my last uh, foreign assignment uh, in Ottawa, I was a member of, of the Rotary there. Um, <clears throat> you do great work. I and mean, we've heard a, a lot of it today, I'm sure. And I know there's a lot more uh, good citizens and when I was growing up, that was the highest compliment in my household. My father would say, he's a good citizen. I knew that person uh, was, uh, uh, had the high, my father had the highest respect 
uh, for that person, someone who gave to the community, who cared about other people, and who engaged in civil dialogue. And I think that's what, uh, beyond the four, uh, the foundation of the four goals that you have, that's that's been my experience with, with Rotary uh, along the way. What I thought I'd do is talk a little bit about my experiences as a diplomat, and also uh, the evolution of how I came to see how important history was uh, in my own day-to-day -day work as a professional serving and representing uh, our country overseas. Um, and that's, I'd like to share a little bit of that with you. First of all, though, I imagine some of you are probably saying, of course, history is important. Uh, why, why do we need this guy to come and tell us history is important? Well, I, I have to tell you during a 26 year career, it, it wasn't evident. And nowadays, uh, we are in what I would call a moment of history shock, where we're concerned about how we understand our history. And But it, when I retired in 2010, it wasn't so. And it was only in the last few years that we've, we've been battling and having this conflict over history, whether it's the 1619 Project or the New York Times, or whether it's these new holidays that we've never heard of before. I mean, who ever heard of Juneteenth before? the last couple of years. This was new to us. And this is, I think, what the, the uh, prayer was a little about. It's important and incumbent upon us to know uh, what has happened in the past that we have uh, neglected or ignored and still be, as I believe I am, a patriot. This is true to the pledging uh, allegiance to the flag. I served my country for a long time, and I believe in my country. Um, <clears throat> I think you know, one of my it was, uh, I had been in the foreign service for 20 years and then went to Mexico. And I think there's no country in the world uh, that better perhaps serves the example of why, of how we don't know our history. Uh, and, and I ran into it constantly uh, in Mexico, how they knew a history that was so different from what I knew. And really, quite frankly, what I didn't know. Uh, I had a very small understanding of the U.S. relationship with Mexico before going there. Uh, but for the Mexicans, they wake up, I, I used to say, they wake up and look in the mirror, and what do they see? They see 1848. What do we see when we look in the mirror as, an, as a nation, as a collective nation? Is 1848 anywhere near that? It's not even close. As I did a little research for this book, I came upon a survey done by a, a group out of San Diego, um, they traveled the United States of what the old boundary was before 1848. And as they were taking this survey of these lines, they came across people nobody they came across knew. This, you used to be living in Mexico before 1848. They had never heard of it. Um, and so, you know, they knew that all of present day Arizona, California, Nevada, New Mexico, Utah, Texas, more than half of Colorado and parts of Wyoming, Kansas and Oklahoma, that had been part of Mexico at some point. Uh, and so this is what they see when they see an American, quite frankly. Um, and this is what we have to bump up against as we interact with our neighbors to the south. This is what they see. And they have uh, developed a foreign policy. They have developed laws that really are very protective of the rest of their territory and the rest of what the, uh, their identity, uh, quite frankly. Um, <clears throat> so how did this appear in my day-to-day -day occurrences? And, and it happened over and over again. And I'll give you one example. Uh, I gave one uh, of Madeleine Albright touring an archeological site in uh, Mexico and, and the Mexicans accuse her of taking over this archaeological site. No, she didn't take it over. She went after hours. Yes, the Americans were there and they were invited by the Mexicans to tour. We did not take it over. Uh, but this was the response that they had. Wow. Uh, and here's another one. That during, during the Iraq war, uh, Mexico was on the Security Council and we went to Mexico to ask them to vote with us for so that we could go in and intervene in Iraq. And they, they never... Uh, uh, said which way they were going to vote, but we had a lot of uh, uh, <clears throat> multiple efforts to try to get them to show their cards and tell us how they were going to, 
going to vote. Well, it never came to the Security Council for a vote. Um, they were opposed to it. Be and why were they opposed to it? They were opposed to it because of 1848. They didn't like did not like countries intervening in other countries' affairs militarily. And that happened to them. And this is their uh, fundamental premise. <clears throat> okay, so I get that. Uh, but during the war, there was a Mexican soldier who died fighting for us. We invited Mexicans uh, to uh, Mexican citizens to come and join us and private citizens. And we promised them a citizenship after if they fought with us. Well, there was a Mexican soldier who died. And he was from a state, a Guanajuato state, and his family wanted full military honor funeral. He died. Uh, and so we earned that. He earned that. And they wanted it in, on Mexican territory. Okay. The Mexicans couldn't believe this. There's, an, a, there's a Mexican citizen who went to fight with the Americans against intervening in some other. How can this happen? Well, we went to the Mexicans. We asked permission to have this funeral as the parents had wanted in, uh, in their hometown. And we said we were going to have a full color guard marching in with the, with the casket. Uh, and uh, they said, uh, no rifles. We won't allow Mex Americans with guns on our territory. Okay, we have ceremonial wooden rifles painted. They said, no. We don't even want the perception of rifles, American guns on our territory. Yeah. We said they can't fire. They're just, they're like the microphone. They're nothing. And and uh, they went back and forth. They said, don't do it. And our, our uh, defense people at the embassy, the Marines said, you know, it's held firm. We're going to do this. This soldier has earned it, the highest honor. And so they went <clears throat> to the funeral. And uh, as soon as they pulled out these wooden uh, ceremonial rifles, the Mexican army surrounded them. We had a standoff at this funeral that was supposed to honor this soldier. And it lasted for a long time. And we were making phone calls. You got to stop this. Uh, again, this is where history got in the way, that our inability to understand how deep this was for uh, Mexico uh, was uh, so important to them that they were willing to uh, ruin the funeral of a fallen soldier. We resolved it. The Mexican troops went away. He had a the, the the wooden arms stayed there. We had we had to go to the president of Mexico really to get his permission to tell them uh, to move away. But again, a small encounter, but huge. It it erupts in a way that history uh, makes a difference. Well, I, I it happened over and over again. And after I um, graduated, how am I doing for time? Oh, fine. Okay, really. Okay, well, I'll just keep going, pull the string. <laughs> and, okay. But after I, you know, went to another assignment in Canada, I saw the same thing. History is there and getting in the way. And, and, and what, after I retired, I thought, I've got to study this. And so I went back to uh, get a master's degree in, uh, in history and memory. And that's why uh, I chose public history. It was because public history looks at the issue of memory, and collective identity, and and narrative and his and history. And so that was of interest to me. And as I was studying this more and more, I was reflecting on other aspects of my career. And over and over again, uh, in these other places, uh, things came up in South Africa, and Canada, and Peru, and Cuba, and Haiti. Uh, and so I kept uh, investigating this and. And, and I saw, I mean, I, I made I sh uh, the example this morning with students at uh, Penn State York that I went down to Haiti after the earthquake and uh, to provide support. Uh, there were thousands of Americans, thousands of soldiers, U.S. soldiers down there. And uh, we were doing a great humanitarian job. The, er the airport had been damaged. The only people who could uh, fix that quickly, who could bring in the support and the supplies by all kinds of means, plane, helicopter, were, the, were our military. And they went in, they set up in a, in a huge way. Well, what was the reaction of the rest of Latin America? Well, the Americans are taking over Haiti. No, we're not. We're not taking over Haiti. We're just going in there for, uh, for humanitarian relief. And, and we're doing a good gesture that we all agreed needed to be done. Hundreds of thousands of people had died in that earthquake. Uh, <clears throat> but... 
our people, the people who are not our friends in Latin America started spreading the rumor that we were planning to take over Haiti. I thought, where did this come from? Well, it came from history. The fact that for 20 years, the United States had taken over history from 1914 to, to 1934. I didn't know that. It would have helped to have known that before going. And how many of the soldiers knew that there had actually been an American military, very controversial American military presence in Haiti during those years? Uh, I would say out of you know two or 3,000 soldiers that were there, there might have been a handful, maybe two, who knew this history. Uh, but certainly I didn't. But the rest of Latin America knew this because that's what they're thinking of. And we didn't have that history that they had. <clears throat> And I saw this, uh, you know, we remember, for example, the burning of Washington during the War of 1812 by the British. The Canadians don't remember that that much. They remember the burning of York, Toronto, by the Americans in the same war before Washington was burned in retaliation for our burning Toronto. And there were other examples, uh, Cuba, Nigeria, um, I didn't know Malcolm X had gone to Nigeria in 1964, and he was complaining about it. He said, don't listen to American diplomats here telling you how much um, race relations in the United States are getting better. Twelve or, you know, 20 years later, I'm in Nigeria telling, telling Nigerians, American race relations, we're making progress. Well, they remember Malcolm X saying, don't listen to those guys. Wow, I didn't know Malcolm X had gone to Nigeria. They did. And they brought it up. They brought it up. They, they asked me at a press conference. We were doing a, a, a ceremony for the first Martin Luther King Day holiday. And the journalist stood up and said, why are you talking about King? Why aren't you talking about Malcolm X? Well, you know about Malcolm X? Yeah, he was here. Oh, I should have known that. But over and over again. So why do we, why does this happen that we don't know the history as well? And I have a few ideas on that. And one is go to a high school now. How many students are now teaching or studying history? There are very few. I mean, history is on the decline in the United States as a subject, uh, even in universities. When I went to UMass history for my master's degree, the number of student, undergraduate students majoring in history when, was, was very small. When Tom and I were in college, it was the number one uh, 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 field of study for uh, majors, but not anymore. Um, <clears throat> Ours is a culture, really, that looks forward. We pride ourselves. What's coming next? We don't look back like that. We've always been a culture that looks forward and not back. Um, <clears throat> ours is a culture that believes our country is exceptional, and I agree with it, but that's what we come up with. That it's so that, when, that we are the indispensable nation, but when there are facts that make us you know, not so exceptional, we tend to uh, hide those. We have hid those. On them. Now we're talking about them in a way uh, that I think is should be healthy and not uh, controversial. Um, <clears throat> and for us overseas, they move our diplomats every two or three years. So it's really hard. Uh, once you get to know a country, you're off to another one you never know anything about. And uh, and I do believe, and I talk about ways to correct this for our for foreign services, uh, is through training. Um, so armed with this, what do we do with this? Well, you know, what do we do with the information of uh, that we're hearing daily uh, about our own uh, past and the uh, legacy, for example, of uh, slavery in this country? What do we do with it? And people are talking about reparations and apology. Well, I, I think there's, there's a discussion that needs to be made on that. And a civil discussion needs to uh, look at that. But I think you, we all know how toxic politically the word apology is. You know, you're, that's not going to work or happen, I believe, uh, in a political sense. I mean, Mitt Romney, his campaign in 2012, his campaign book was called No Apology. They, they tried to brush uh, Barack Obama. He's the apology president. So it's very difficult when, when Obama went to... Uh, Japan for the anniversary of the bombing of the, uh, the nuclear weapon in, in Hiroshima, people were worried, are you going to apologize for that? No, all he did was lay a wreath 
And when Pr Prime Minister Abe came to the United States, he laid a wreath at, it's a gesture, it was an important gesture. So I don't think you need to go all the way to the reparations or apology. I think recognizing, acknowledging history is really a good, solid first step in this process uh, of incorporating uh, the, the learnings that we've had. In fact, the sociology said there's a, there's a continuum, acknowledging, disavowing, repenting, and offering restitution. But I do believe we can uh, take history uh, and use it to our advantage in our foreign relations. And I have two examples if I have time. Okay. Uh, one is in Haiti. You know, we had all these people in Haiti. We had every government agency down there, health and human services, education, and they were all trying to save lives. Then one day in my office, I get a call from the Smithsonian. They want to go down because there was artwork and, and historic archives in Haiti that were destroyed. And what are you kidding? They're saving lives. People, there are hundreds of thousands of people need shelter. We, we, we can't focus on that. And, and they said, you have to focus on that. And you have to focus on that, they said, because it's important to Haiti. Oh. And so after weeks of arguing among the people in the embassy in Haiti, uh, they said, we're going. I don't care. Uh, we're not a government agency. We're a quasi-independent agency. We are going down. They set up training. There are beautiful art murals, historic cathedrals were destroyed. The archives were destroyed in Haiti. And they set up a, a program down there to preserve uh, Haiti's historic artifacts. Uh, and it meant a lot to Haiti. And you know why I think it meant a lot? Because I remembered 1812. What's one thing we remember about the War of 1812? Dolly Madison saving the picture of George Washington. So imagine for the Haitians how important it was to save what was important to them. Uh, very important. And so I think that's how we can use history, just by respecting the other country's history. What they hold dear is, is one way of getting what we, you know, advancing our national interests just by respecting their history and identity. I have one final example of that. And that was we had in Peru a cultural patrimony agreement uh, with the Peruvians. And this was an agreement to return stolen artifacts. Their archaeological items that had been stolen by looters and sold on the black market. And so these, Peru has uh, just hundreds and hundreds of archaeological sites. And we've seen some of them, whether it's uh, Machu Picchu or the, the gold of the Lord of Sipan. Some of you may have seen they've been in National Geographic over and over again. Well, these items are on the black market. But we have made an agreement with Peru that we were going to seize any items that came in our customs, any items that came into the United States that were looted. We were going to seize from auctions in the United States any items that we uh, encountered that were looted. Well, that's a big project, and and I'm sure our customs is is has this whole database of what our possibilities of every time there's an auction they go through their database. So when we were in Peru, about every three months, we'd get this shipment of seized items back from the United States, and we would make a big you know big a big to do about it. Get the ambassador come out, a minister come out, and we would uh, return these items to the United States. And so what happened was we bought a lot of goodwill in Peru because we returned what was important to them. We returned items that had been stolen back to them. And uh, we did it on our own goodwill. It, took, it cost us a lot of money. We asked Peru to do a better job of protecting their sites, and they did. Uh, but it was a gesture. And, and one ambassador, one of my colleagues said, "This what you want to do is in the foreign service and the <laughs> world of diplomacy is fill up the well of goodwill. So when you have a message that's not so easy, you've had, you can dip into this well of goodwill and throw a little sugar on top of the message that you're, you're asking of the foreign government to, uh, to swallow. Anyway, um, <clears throat> let me leave it. Oh, what should we do in the Foreign Service? Training, training, training. I had in my 26 career, um, a total of six months of training. That included uh, four months of language. I learned Spanish and French 
Uh, and then when I went to Africa, I went to Latin America, I had two weeks of area training. By comparison, the military area officers, they get two years. They get a master's degree. Then they get a year on the continent where they're going to do nothing but to study and to learn. Now that's training. Can we do that in our foreign service? Too expensive. But two weeks isn't enough either. We really need to do a better job of training our officers who are representing the, the United States overseas. That's the big one uh, that I would say. The other is people look at this and want some authors, uh, Harvard professors, we said we need historic sensibility. And this is more of a cultural in the United States, just to adopt a sensibility to history uh, that's a little more profound than what we have now. And I think it just circles back to what the prayer was at the beginning of what the importance of the idea of a historic sensibility. Thank you. I, I, I was driven around York today and all I saw was history. It's great here, really beautiful buildings. And so I, I'm probably speaking to the uh, people in this area where there's history on every, every street corner. But uh, anyway, that's my talk. Let's expand it beyond. Is, is there time for, uh, okay. I can, no, I can't sing a song. My, yeah. my wife will walk out. <laughs> okay. So. You met Mary in Gabon. And Gabon's been in the news. Uh, they had a coup there August 30th. So I read that headline and it's like, wow, that's a coup. That's an unstable country. That's a bad thing. But it's a little more complicated than that. Can you can you mention your take on what's happening over there? So unfortunately, I'm of the age where I am history. I'm living history now. And uh, we were both in Gabon when there was a president uh, who was uh, had been, we, we were there in the late 70s. This young man at age 30 became president. His name was Omar Bongo. And it's a small country. It's a rich country in oil producing, but other minerals and t timber as well. Um, and he served for a long time. When he died, he passed along uh, his presidency to his son. Uh, and so from 1967 until August, there was one family in charge of Gabon. He was already uh, <clears throat> grooming his son to be the next president. And, and they have elections. And, and the coup happened uh, three hours after the election results uh, were, were announced, saying that this president, this family, this son of the first uh, president was reelected. Well, my wife um, <clears throat> uh, participated in an election when she was a Peace Corps volunteer in Gabon. Uh, she was at home preparing her uh, lessons for uh, <laughs> Her school the next day and somebody a policeman knocked on her door and they said come on you got to go vote me i'm an american no get her going to vote and so they took her to the uh, uh elect election uh, polling place they handed her a piece of paper folded it up and said go put it in that box and he won he he, he won he, he i think he had a 110 percent of the vote so there's a democracy there. There was voting. It, it, people complained about the last two or three elections in a row about fraud. We gave money to that president to run a fair election this past year to four African countries who were having elections. And by all accounts, people were ready and already talking about a stolen election, even three hours afterwards. And so the military stepped in. It presents the difficulty for the United States this was, a demo this was a democracy. There were elections and a military took over. We don't like that. But what kind of election had it been? And I think uh, we're now at the point um, where we're, it's a wait and see. We've read about other coups further north uh, uh, in, along what they call the Sahel, the, the S Southern Sahara, uh, and where, there are where they are battling terrorists uh, and uh, <clears throat> democratically elected governments, governments were thrown out there by militaries and were opposed to that. In Gabon, the people were uh, uh, overjoyed, I should say. 
uh, for the most part, um, that this, this had been too long in coming. We want to see what happens next. Our official statement says, we don't like coups. We want elections, fair elections. So we're, we're kind of uh, straddling the fence right now. Does it matter um, <clears throat> to the United States? Gabon is a small, how many people had heard of Gabon before coming here? Okay. They called me up for the Peace Corps. Are you going to Gabon? Tell me on, it was a Friday. Tell us on Monday. Well, where's Gabon, I said. They said, right below Cameroon. I said, where's Cameroon? 22-year-old, <laughs> I ran to the National Geographic, looked it up. Okay, I'll go. Uh, but uh, it is important. Uh, it, it, it's an important country in a number of ways for us. Uh, it's important miner mineral-wise. Uh, when, when we were there, it was a, it's a French colony. The French were there in a big way. Guess who the largest foreign contingent is there now? China. There are more Chinese in Gabon now than, than, and they're taking all the wealth, the timber, the manganese, the uranium out of Gabon uh, for their own purposes. Next door, they're building a naval port in uh, Equatorial Guinea. Is that a concern for the United States? You bet. You bet. So we are watching this. Yes, way back there. You spoke. Thank, thank you for your uh, remarks today. You spoke both to the uh, lack of adequate training uh, in the uh, State Department and the tradition uh, of moving people every three years. That seems an odd contradiction. Is there a reason for that pattern? And uh, could you speak to it? You know, the, the reason is there's something about the American character where we develop clientitis. And we begin to uh, take on the characteristics of advocating for Mexico when we should really be advocating uh, for the United States. I think that's one of the major reasons. Uh, they want us to be generalists. Uh, they don't want us to be specialists. Now, there are a few exceptions to that. Uh, people who have been to Japan, Japan is such a di difficult language and culture to understand. They're willing to send people uh, away over and over again back to uh, Japan. And, and there may be a few other exceptions where people return to the countries where they've served. But um, I think that's the main, the main reason. As a generalist, did it help me in Canada knowing, his, knowing Mexico? Absolutely. Our NAFTA partners are, that helped a lot, having that kind of cross fertilization. Did it help me in Canada, for example, knowing South Africa? maybe a little, but uh, they do want uh, people to serve in more than one area. Uh, way back, yeah. Thank you for coming, big dog. I appreciate that uh, you played good defense at Princeton. Um, my question is, in your view, how do foreign countries view the United States and what we call or think that we are a free nation with democracy is, uh, can you, without spending 20 hours in a few minutes, can you uh, give your opinion of the view of the United States in the eyes of foreigners? Did, were you at Penn State York this morning? Because a student asked me that very same question, and it's a great question. Um, <clears throat> I had said to the students, well, wh why do we even have diplomats? We're representing the country, or what do diplomats do? And we do a number of things. Uh, we take care of American citizens. Anybody have lost their passport overseas? What do you do? You go to the American embassy, uh, and, and we protect, we try to, protect American citizens. But another thing we do is we interpret that country back to the decision makers in Washington and elsewhere who are making decisions about, so they can understand a number of things about how to approach uh, the, the country or how not to approach the country. And so we're interpreters as well. And we're advocates. 
we take the policy and we go down, we run to the foreign ministry or we run to the radio station and we talk. This is what the United States is trying to do. And I'll tell you, the, the word I used the most overseas was cooperation. We're looking for cooperation. We, 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 you know, that's all we were after. We're not territory or anything. It's cooperation. We, we believe that there are many things in the world that uh, can't be resolved by the United States alone. We have to work with, with uh, other countries. Um, so as we're doing this overseas, guess what? Every embassy in Washington is doing the same thing back to their own country. Imagine the cable going back to Kiev or to Moscow uh, from, the, from those embassies to their departments of foreign affairs this morning or to Pretoria or to Mexico City. What are they saying in this cable, in their cables back? And I, I, I can tell you what the headline is, that subject, dysfunction. America can't get anything done. Really? We can get stuff done. It take, it's hard. It's not easy. But I really feel sorry for a foreign diplomat in Washington trying to figure out where the power centers are. Who do I go to to make my case? Any, anyway, I think they're, they're looking at what does this mean for who's, who's applauding in the world right now over what happened last night? The guy in Moscow is applauding. He's very happy. Yeah. In my opinion. In uh, doing your research and writing your book, um, to what extent, how would you characterize the reception at the State Department for your recommendations about more in-depth training? Uh, is I anybody did, listening? I did. I've done three or four different presentations for State Department officers. One at the State Department Library, one with an associate at the training center, another uh, with a couple of others. And, and, and one of the responses is this is a call to arms. We have to do a better job training. Uh, and, and that's the kind of response I had wanted uh, to get out of. Now, have they done anything? I'm not sure yet. They have not contacted me to come help. I'm not probably the person to do that. But uh, I would think training is going to be the biggest you know, I, I, I did, I want to say this, that I had one person stand up one, in one audience and said, you're a traitor. Wow. It wasn't a State Department employee. I thought, well, what do you mean? He says, look, look at what you're saying things against the United States. And, and I said, uh, you know, I spent 26 years advocating for the United States overseas, and I'm not a traitor. I'm a public servant, and I'm a patriot. Uh, but I do believe it's important to know. It's important for me to have known. I wished I had known the history of these, of our experiences uh, in these countries before I went into them. Uh, and that would have helped me acknowledge, okay, this happened. You know, Obama acknowledged, and, and I'm not, I don't want to be political, but uh, he went to one of his first uh, international events was a uh, was a summit meeting in Trinidad, the summit of the Americas. And we were so afraid. Hugo Chavez, a former president who, a thorn in our side from Venezuela, he, he was going to hijack this meeting. He came running up to Obama with a book. And the book was this, uh, it was called Open Veins. And it was how the United States has bled Latin America dry. So there it is. That's the public perception of Obama's first uh, multilateral summit. And later on, the president of Nicaragua started, had, went into this long diatribe of everything you've done in Latin America. And Obama uh, diffused it with humor. He says, you can't blame me for things that happened before I was born. Let's look forward. Let's not be trapped by the past. Well, let's not be trapped by the past, but let's remember it too. Let's look forward, but let's remember the past to help us look forward. John, you know, sometimes we forget how big the world is, but also how history is even bigger than the world itself. And, you know, when you multiply geography with time, I don't really know what the answer is, but it tells me that John's message is very important. And we as a historic club, and yes, being 107 years old, I think we can call ourselves historic at this point. 
Um, and part of an international organization, we're part of RI, it's important for us to understand how we're different from other people, but also how we're the same as other people. So I thank you for sharing your perspective and stories with our club. Let's have another round of applause for John. In honor of John's program, he has signed the book platelet May Among the Stars by Rhoda Ahmed, or uh, yes, Ahmed, and it'll be donated to the Devers Elementary School in New York City, along with the bookmark by the students at Creative York. Thank you, Lynn Bergdahl. And if you thought that was a great program, and it was, wait till you hear what we have for next week. We're going to hear from Peter Batros of the Shine Music Foundation, an organization right here in York that strives to provide music education to every student in need, develop their leadership and their self-esteem, and build a community by unifying diverse groups of people through love and passion for music. With that, have an amazing Rotarian week. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>